Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Savitt. I'm Director of Communications at the Center for Security Policy, and I'm pleased to welcome you back. Our last program was just before the election, and quite a lot has happened since then. You can access archives of our voter education webinar series, the topics of which are still very well relevant, uh, and all of our previous webinars at our website, securefreedom.org. Today's program is entitled our Constitutional Republic Depends on Fighting Electoral Fraud, featuring our special guest, Colonel Phil Waldron, as well as my center colleagues, Frank Gaffney and Michael Waller. Please note that you are in listen-only mode, but you can submit your text questions in the Q&A box on your GoToWebinar panel, and I'll read as many questions as possible at the end of the program. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash securefreedom and on our website, securefreedom.org. And with that, I'll hand it over to our executive chairman, Frank Gaffney. Adam, thank you very much. Thank you as always for your expertise and uh, excellent work in these webinars. And thanks to all of you for joining us in what may be one of the most, if not, well, the most important of them, namely the question that is before us today on the nature of election fraud that has been discerned so far in the course of the election 2020 presidential race, most especially, and what it portends, both for the outcome of that race, which is still undetermined, and for the future course of our republic. And I don't think there's any overstating the importance of this election and in the latter regard. We are truly at a fork in the road. Uh, we may well have elected individuals and policies as a result of their personnel choices that are so starkly different, depending on which outcome pertains, as to be really uh, determinative of whether this country survives as a constitutional republic of the kind that we've been privileged to live in to this point. We have two extraordinarily qualified individuals with us today to discuss what we have learned so far about fraud in this election and what reasonable conclusions can be drawn from what we have learned so far. And most importantly, what we need to do in light of the evidence, which seems to be growing by the day, that very important, some would say systematic, and certainly material fraud occurred in at least selected areas. I think six are particularly relevant, but we'll talk more about that with our guests, that decided, apparently, the outcome of elections in six different states, swing states, all of them. Um, let me introduce them both, uh, and we will begin a, an informal conversation for a time, and then we will, uh, as Adam said, uh, welcome your questions. To first, Phil Waldron, Colonel Phil Waldron, United States Army retired, a highly skilled, highly accomplished, highly regarded military officer who, in the course of his career, seems to have mastered virtually all of the weaponry of the United States Army, um, from air cavalry on through to cyber warfare, psychological operations, and other black arts of, uh, I guess, what might be called political warfare. He has brought them to bear with great effect against enemies of this country, and now he is trying to ensure that they're not used against us by, well, as our oath of office has it, enemies foreign and domestic. It's a pleasure to have Phil Waldron with us. You've seen him, of course, um, as a featured expert witness in a number of uh, these fora that have been held hearings, some of them are called, in some of those swing states. And we're going to have a chance to drill down with him a little bit on some of the topics he's discussed in those settings, often uh, under uh, the careful uh, interrogatories of Rudy Giuliani, who I'm very sorry to say has come down with uh, COVID-19. Uh, we wish him well. I gather he's uh, he is doing reasonably well, and, and we need uh, 
I think all of us to pray for his uh, speedy recovery. Our second guest is my colleague at the Center for Security Policy, an old friend as well as a colleague of many years, uh, Michael Waller. Dr. Waller has been also uh, active in some of these spaces, uh, as has Phil Waldron. Um, he's got a PhD in international relations from the University of Boston. He has taught at the Institute of World Politics for many years, helping to inculcate in a new generation of policy practitioners the skills that he has acquired going back to his days of helping Ronald Reagan uh, and the Nicaraguan Contras fight communist enemies of this country in Central America. Uh, Mike Waller is these days the senior analyst for strategy at the Center for Security Policy, um, and he concentrates there on propaganda, political warfare, psychological warfare, and subversion, all of which I think it's fair to say are seemingly at work in the crisis at hand. So gentlemen, thanks to both of you for being here. And again, thanks to those of you who are tuning in um, either live here as we broadcast or by videotape. Um, Phil, let me start with you if I can. We are of course uh, being buffeted day in and day out by information. Uh, some of it seems to be, um, shall we say, uh, contradicted by certain fact checkers. Uh, you yourself have been uh, challenged by some of them. But give us kind of at the 30,000 foot level, your professional assessment, uh, particularly in the cyber arena of the degree to which fraud is now evident in the 2020 election and not just fraud, but material, as I say, fraud, fraud that could conceivably result in a very different outcome if it is taken seriously and followed to uh, the logical conclusion. Well, I, I think earlier you mentioned the, the information warfare, the psychological warfare. Uh, I think the election piece is one slice of that pizza. I mean, that's that's a slice. But we've got warfare on our educational system. We've got warfare on our uh, justice system. Uh, it, it's it's multifaceted, and this is one piece that comes around every two years. But it is definitely a part of the strategic plan, um, and and I see it as uh, as pure mal pure. Marxism uh, to bend the will of the populace uh, to basically turn them into <laughs> turn them into sheep and it follow it follow it anything. The uh, the election uh, piece though the the electronic manipulation um, these are really systems. The uh, they're called election management systems for a reason and they're they're all interrelated um, down from the poll pad at the the precinct. Uh, place to the tabulators, to the central uh, central tabulation facilities, uh, to the aggregation systems. Um, all this information is pumped up to the uh, Amazon Web Server Cloud, and uh, there are vulnerabilities. Uh, I, I believe most of these are pumped into the, the S3 buckets. Um, and once it goes to the Amazon Cloud, then it's it's there, and it's in China, it's in Iran, it's in Russia, it's in uh, Germany, Spain, the UK, it, it's, you know, it, it's everywhere. And so the the fallacy that, you know, the U.S. is in control of its elections is is purely a fallacy. These commercial companies balk at every um, at every, you know, juncture, uh, looking at the code, determining how the votes are actually processed and, and manipulated. Uh, I had a long conversation yesterday with a, a, a an attorney who process, you know, he works in federal uh, federal courts, and he does intellectual property suits all the time. And he says, you know, there's there's no reason that the uh, source code is is protected. So they 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 look at uh, intellectual property suits all the time, where protective orders are issued, source code is analyzed uh, to ensure that intellectual property is is maintained and and not stolen. So this one area. Um, the, the lobbyists and they, they've been successful at fending off the, um, the, these companies, ESNS, Dominion Heart, 
uh, SGO Smartmatic had been successful at fending off attempts to review the source code. And in software, you know, source code is is where things either happen accurately or or they don't. Um, but if you look at the industries that are most open to fraud, the banking industry, moving money back and forth, all of those industries um, are inspectable uh, under protective orders. Even if it's intellectual property uh, under the protective order, that intellectual property is protected, but their processes and their procedures are able to be analyzed to detect fraud. So the, the election management systems uh, are set up to defraud the, the American and, and other countries around the world who use these systems. And it's a, it, it's a very hidden circular organization. Uh, ownerships of these, these companies are, are very cloudy. And uh, if our Treasury Department gets involved and uh, digs into them to determine exactly who owns, whether they're uh, officers of foreign governments, uh, whether they are businesses, front businesses uh, owned by the, the Chinese Communist Party, um, there's, there's a lot of things. Iranian, <laughs> Iranian companies, there's, there's a lot of information that needs to be looked at by our Treasury Department because our federal election systems are designated as national critical infrastructure. And that's happened under the Obama administration when Jay Johnson was a, the uh, DHS secretary. Phil, you've set a very rich table there. Um, I Sorry. guess you listen to what you have been able to discern about, you know, the provenance of the software and the corporate, you know, uh, wiring diagram, as well as the actual nature of the machinery itself and its connection to the internet, to the to the cloud, um, the question occurs, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and it seems as though uh, everything could go wrong. Uh, Mike, let me turn to you because, as I mentioned, you've spent a lot of time in Latin America. One of the things that we've learned about the provenance of these computer um, systems, the software, the, the electronic tabulation machines and so on, is that it seems to have all started with a prominent character in Latin America, namely Hugo Chavez, the past dictator of Venezuela. Uh, tell us a little bit about him and how that plays into how incredibly we've gotten to where we are today. Sure. Well, first, you're going to think, why on earth would the United States of America buy software whose DNA is based on a system that was personally designed by the, a fifth rate leader of a fifth rate power, Venezuela. And what purposes those were used for. So, so this software, Smartmatic software, which has been described as the DNA of all the software running our vote counting systems, what was personally designed by this uh, regime leader who was a Cuban controlled asset, Hugo Chavez, to use the democratic process of his longstanding democracy to keep him, to give himself dictatorial powers and to keep him and his regime in power uh, perpetually. So that's what it was designed for. And right now evidence has been submitted to the court from an eyewitness who was part of Hugo Chavez's inner circle, who was assigned to handle the design and development of Smartmatic vote counting software. So this is what the United States uh, voting systems adopted, either that's that those systems directly or elements thereof for our system. And the whole purpose, and a lot of other witnesses have come forward either with anonymously in affidavits or publicly on, on video, including the former chief of the Venezuelan the Supreme Electoral Council, whose job was to count the ballots, and she said seven years ago that this was a danger. You have the, you have it created for the purpose of stealing elections and drawing votes away from one candidate to another candidate in manners that cannot be detected. Now, adding to that it's, it's is the national much. security concern that the that the Venezuelan uh, security force around President Chavez and now Maduro is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Cuban intelligence service, which itself is a remarkably adept, extremely capable human intelligence service, one of the best in the world. So you have therefore the Cuban service, which is a surrogate of the Russians and they sell their services to the Chinese, 
are somehow behind this Smartmatic software that's counting our votes. So I want to come to you, back to you, Phil, in just a second on the sort of forensic details and your evaluation of how this has played out in this election. But before I do, Mike, can you shed light on how it is that this unbelievable reliance on such machines has come to be the case in whatever it is, I think 28 of our states. I think Phil could shed more light on it than I can because he's more involved at that level. But the, the, the question is first, why did US counterintelligence not detect this when it's the job of the FBI to do precisely that? And if you look at who was chief of counterespionage at the time at the FBI, it was a man named Peter Strzok who should have detected this back in 2017 when it was being discussed openly in the Venezuelan news media. Instead, he was busy pushing the Russian collusion narrative and everything else. So the Bureau wasn't doing his job. And here we are today. Here we are today. We've got a little bit of an overview. And maybe with me, too. Maybe with me, too. We can clear this up. Well, let me bring it back to you. Talk about the way in which this unbelievable arrangement foisted upon the and the extent your analysis as to your professional demonstrated that was stolen, not just in this way, but particularly in this way, these electronic devices, and uh, done so decisively. Yeah, so I, I think um, what has been demonstrated, and it's actually you know been been included in an HBO documentary. Um, I don't know if if people have watched it or looked at it, but um, you know it's shown how using a USB drive. Um, there was a video clip that's been floating around as a as a part of that. I believe Harry Hursty was the uh, the expert that uh, redesigned it. It showed um, voters putting their ballots in, and they you know, said, "Okay, I want X amount of you to vote this way, and X amount of you to vote this way." They put them through, and the tape spits out a completely different number. And they, you know, looked at it, and so these machines are not tabulators; uh, they're they're calculators, and there are so many different ways um, that we've identified that you can um, you can make a direct change to the voting system all the way up from the Amazon um, web servers, the Oracle databases where um, the passwords are all all published there the doors are left open and if either that's you know by uh, by design or by total incompetence either way it's unacceptable but you can download a CSV file, an Excel spreadsheet, change column D to column M, whatever candidate you want to, upload it, and that prints back and is backloaded down to all the other subsequent systems downstream. Uh, and there, there have been examples um, in uh, Matt Bevins, the Kentucky governor's race, where that 560 vote shift happened. So that represented 1,120 votes, which was about 20% of the margin that uh, that race was won. And when you look at the, the totality of everything else, and again, I, I you know, as, a, as an information warfare officer, as a cavalry officer, you have to look at the whole battlefield. You can't just look at one slice. But every other um, top ticket Republican in that race won by 200,000 plus votes. And then the governor lost by 5,000 votes. And we saw on CNN where 560 of those 5,000 votes flipped. They, they literally decremented from Bevins and, and credited to the other candidate. And so that can be a change. Yeah, 2018, 2018 election was decided in the, the Kentucky governor's race by this very narrow margin. And it seems not just those 500 votes, but, but more being flipped. Correct. So and there were five that. instances in the 2020 primary, the presidential, uh, I'm sorry, the general election, where the vote flipped at 20,000 vote increments from President Trump to vice president, uh, former vice president Biden. 
so yeah. those mechanisms are still there, and that's at the highest level, that at, at the server level uh, interdiction. So just to wrap this part of it up, uh, Phil, is there any question in your mind that this kind of manipulation of these tabulation calculators, electronic devices, whatever you want to call them, um, took place in the critical, is it is it six cities or counties that were most especially subjected to fraud and, and decisively so? Um, in favor, as it happens, uh, of Vice President Joe Biden. The battleground states, um, and and we can we can even expand it past the seven to include uh, New Mexico and Virginia. There's ample evidence of uh, uh, indicators of fraudulent activity in both of those states as well. But um, the uh, it, just as recently as two days ago in Ware County, Georgia. They set up their equipment. Uh, I, I think when I testified before the Senate in Georgia, I gave them a recommendation on how they could run the Senate uh, runoffs accurately is to, to set up your, your polling pads and your tabulators, ensure that nothing is connected to the internet, kill every wireless signal in the building so that uh, you, you can't get any stray wireless uh, connectivity and run your blanket set of 200 votes for one candidate, 200 votes for another candidate. When you get a tape of 200 votes each that it's accurate, you put a guard on that system, don't allow any changes to the software, and you run your election, you do a manual add-up of the tapes. Ware County, Georgia, they did that, and they found that there was a 13% decrement to uh, President Trump's ballots and a 13% plus up to former Vice President Biden's uh, ballots, and that's in the, the Ware County uh, press release. Uh, and there, there's a you know the, the gentleman tried to testify Friday uh, before the Georgia Senate, and that was uh, you know he wasn't able to yet. But those instances are are the more that we the more that we do these uh, the forensic examinations, the more of that that we're going to find. And I I've said it before, it's like there's a car in the in the corner of the parking lot. There's a very strong odor emanating from the car. There's a bloody handprint on the hood of the trunk, and there's a pool of coagulated blood underneath the trunk. Logic would tell you that there may be a dead body in the trunk of that car, but we don't have permission to open the trunk of the car to find the dead body. And then we can say, okay, well, it was a, a gunshot wound to the chest, gunshot wound to the head, strangulation, asphyxiation. What was the cause of death? So that's where we are with with this whole thing, and the fact that um, you know maybe there's a, a legal um, rule or, or a legal standard that hasn't uh, been met to prove that uh, there there's fraudulent activity. But I think the American populace is is waking up. They're aware that uh, all is all is not right, and um, that, you know we're, we're going to demand a uh, a reckoning. And. If the trunk is open, uh, further evidence is uh, quite possibly established beyond a reason. Now, let me come back to you. And apologize for the here. Um, we've been talking so far about these electronic systems. I think unquestionably have the capacity massively the electric. Um, what can you tell me about the techniques that appear to have been used, particularly in the swing states so far? So far. Prosaic, kind of, kind of, kind of, perhaps, but still. You're breaking up just a little bit, Frank. I'm not sure if it's it's on my end, but. Uh, in that to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Mike Waller, Mike if, Waller I could. if I could. Okay. The other kinds of fraud, could you hear me, Mike? Yeah, well, first, there, there are all kinds of fraud from the old fashioned ballot stuffing to the newer uh, uh, collecting of ballots or, or scanning them multiple times inside the system or the even much newer kind, which is the Smartmatic brand of fraud, which is designed to to shift entire votes from one block to another in ways that that can't normally be detected. And we have to keep in mind that the Smartmatic system was developed for electoral systems that are much more robust than ours is in terms of voter ID and security. So in countries like Venezuela, uh, even El Salvador, a lot of other Latin American countries, I don't know if Mexico uses Smartmatic, but Mexico has an extremely strict voter ID system. 
where you're issued a voter ID number the way we have social security numbers, but it comes in an a card with electronics embedded in it with your thumbprint, your signature, your own image, your home address, and you cannot vote in that area if everything, including the home address, does not match up. Uh, Venezuela has a similar system like that, and one where you would also put, dip your, your finger or your thumb in dye after you voted to prove that you voted so you can't vote a second time. Smartmatic was designed to foil all those systems. So you think of our system, which is, has many different uh, ways and no voter ID at all in many states. It's a much softer target than these other countries are. So we're up against the sophisticated uh, DNA backbone of, of the software in most American electoral systems that was really developed for much harder targets than the ones we have. So we're pretty easy. Frank, That's, just to add on to into what Mike of, said. You know, isn't it really that, you know, banana republics have better electronic and other systems for protecting against fraud than we do? Sorry, Phil, go ahead. No, I, I, just to add on to that, um, you know, uh, Dominion is a Canadian company and Canada doesn't even use them. They use paper ballots. So that's that's not a joke, but uh, it is part of the fact. Um, you, you add in a lot of factors to, to what Mike was talking about, but the um, operationalization of the of covid um they they made a lot of concessions to standard voting practices for this year which drastically increased the um, mail-in ballot uh, request um, and that just provided tons and tons of opportunities for for fraud um, i don't know if, if you guys you probably do recall but back in the summer um, we had uh, monstrous hacking uh, into U.S. law enforcement uh, data systems, and there was a lot of breaches of, of U.S. law enforcement databases. So if you look particularly to Arizona and Maricopa County, they deviated from sig signature val validation on the um, the ballots, the, the mail-in ballots, and they set up e e voicemails or calling systems where you could call in to verify your signature with one piece of identifying information about, about yourself. And so if, again, you know, there's, there's not a direct correlation or proof that the law enforcement system hack uh, was used to validate individual uh, mail-in uh, ballots in Maricopa County. But I'm just saying with our electronic systems, the DISA breaches, OPM breaches, uh, all of my information is out there and, and the Chinese have everything. But um, there is, the system is set up to be rife with opportunities for corruption. So the possibilities are, are endless down to the voter level uh, with, with mail-in ballots. There were, there were reports in, in Maricopa County of boxes of ballots, mail-in ballots coming in with the envelopes were already open there was a there was a breach in chain of custody and the signature verification process was uh, not followed as per the law. They had workarounds, which again, lots of opportunity for uh, for fraud. This is part of what's so perplexing, I think, to most Americans, and I consider myself really very much a layman in all of this, uh, as opposed to you experts. But we are hearing about these kinds of problems. Uh, we're hearing about, uh, by some counts, a, a thousand or so affidavits from individuals who personally are bearing witness to fraud. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, security tapes turn up suddenly that suggest that there was uh, in the dark of night when all of the balloting was stopped, uh, the counting was stopped rather, that. Uh, uh, suddenly they're coming out of suitcases and so on. I, I just, I wonder whether you guys can speak to the credibility of this kind of evidence that uh, should it be sufficient to warrant, to go back to your analogy, uh, Phil, uh, you know, getting a search warrant to get into the dang truck, uh, the trunk of the car, I should say. Is that now, um, something that is being blocked uh, for evidentiary reasons or for political ones? Maybe, Mike, I could start with you. 
it's being blocked for political ones. I mean, you see even today, NBC ran an article having the typical line now, the customary words, these are baseless allegations. And therefore, everything should be dismissed when, when it's full of evidence and, and in, under the, it meets every le legal standard of evidence before the court and really every legal standard of evidence in, in the realm of journalism. So this is people pushing an agenda, not simply because they're biased and have a different point of view. In terms of in investigating, I can't, I can't uh, comment on everything, but I can speak for myself. I received two unsolicited mail-in ballots in my name from the District of Columbia government where I live uh, when I'm an independent voter. So they sent me two ballots for some strange reason, wouldn't answer why, and weren't interested in taking my name off the rolls, even though it's there. Plus ballots of people who were never DC voters also delivered to my house. And I talked to my neighbors and each one of my neighbors reported the same thing. So DC was never going to be a Trump place anyway, but there were other items that where they wanted to get certain people elected. So, so there's a, you know, DC is certainly not free of fraud uh, in these cases. And it certainly isn't a case of ineptitude because it's so systematic. The, it, as far as other investigations though, when you have evidence that is brought to authorities, they're duty bound to investigate it. And if they simply dismiss it saying, sorry, there's nothing to see here, then you know that there is uh, a problem. And we've seen this firsthand in the FBI where you've got plenty of good agents doing their jobs, but they're the people who, who uh, are, occupy the nervous system of the FBI have become very politicized and do not want to investigate certain things because of the agenda they have. It's, it's such a scandal, and it, and it really puts, going back to what I said at the beginning, the, the country itself at risk. Um, Phil, let me just ask you about something that uh, you and, and Mike have now both touched on, um, this idea that uh, there's nothing to see here, folks. Move along. You personally have been assailed for your testimony. Uh, as I recall, it was before the Pennsylvania um, legislators, but uh, probably the others as well. Um, and yet, you know, you mentioned this documentary, and I really commend it to everybody. It's called Kill Chain. Mm -hmm. uh, it was released shortly before the election, and I believe the end of September. It seems to have been put together by people who are more likely to be on the left rather than on the right. They're hackers. They're, you know, people who uh, make a living exploring these kinds of vulnerabilities in computer systems. And they said a number of them in as many words, you know, the Republic is in jeopardy if these vulnerabilities are not corrected. So you have that evidence before the fact from what I think even the left would consider to be objective sources. Uh, and yet you're still getting, Phil, this sort of criticism that um, it's all baseless allegations, it's unfounded, it's, uh, it's uh, nothing to see here, folks, as they say. Uh, talk about your personal experiences with these critics and your response to them. Um, well, I, you know, frankly, I don't listen to them because I really don't care. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say what I know, and um, they, they're free to criticize me. Um, I've done the research. Um, we've actually pulled out testimony from uh, Senator Warren, uh, Senator Klobuchar, um, we pulled a 40 plus page document from Stacey Abrams uh, website in Georgia put together by one of her staffers that points out all the, the vulnerabilities of the ESNS system. Um, the, the lady uh, senator, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, but uh, she, she questioned me in Georgia. Um, she, there was a video of her testifying on the, the floor of the Georgia Senate last year about vulnerabilities. There's been testimony on the floor of the United States Senate as late as 2019 that, uh, you know, decried the fact that we're bringing this 10 year old software that's full of holes into our, our election system. Um, yeah, I think before now, uh, there was a very small subset of folks who had even looked at it and who were even aware of the vulnerabilities. Um, you know, most people think I go, I, I put my ballot and my ballot counts. And then when you show them that's not actually true, people are people are beginning to be uh, you know aware and awakened, and um, it's it's amazing that 
you know, talking to legislators and, and senators at, at the state level around um, the country, they're not aware of the, the Federal Election Commission guidelines, of the uh, Help America Vote Act, of the federal uh, the FISMA, the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, and all those requirements that are set to establish the certification of an election of which none of these systems meet the standards. There's not a national standard for elections, even though DHS has, you know, you know, decreed that the national federal election system is designated as national critical infrastructure. It's, it's so let me ask both of you. It, it, we've had, in part, the pushback against the sort of evidence that uh, that you both have described. Um, often citing uh, Christopher Krebs, who was the guy who was supposed to be in charge of that federal agency within the Department of Homeland Security, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, who said this was the most secure election ever. How do we square that kind of information with what you presented here? Um, again, do, does this come down to, to politics? This is a guy who was working for the Trump administration, for heaven's sakes. Mike, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, well, there were a lot of people working for the Trump administration who I wouldn't trust you know, taking out my trash. So, so putting that aside for a second, if you look at the State Department's own standards for international elections overseas, when the United States and the uh, European Union and the international human rights groups go to monitor elections in other countries, uh, the United States fails those standards in the 2020 elections. Uh, if we were a foreign country and the State Department was evaluating the 2020 elections here, uh, we might even be sanctioned uh, as, a, as a nation for having fundamentally flawed and fraudulent elections under the State Department's own standards. Take it a step further. Uh, if you follow even Jimmy Carter's standards at the Carter Center in Atlanta, which is held up globally as the gold standard for election monitoring, the United States fails most of those standards as well. It's a very extensive set of standards that the Carter uh, Center has, and another one of them that, that isn't part of the official electoral process, but the Carter Center is crucial to free and fair elections, is a credible and impartial news media. So again, we fail even Jimmy Carter's standards. And, and, and Jimmy Carter signed off on Hugo Chavez's election with the first Smartmatic scandal. So he didn't learn lessons from that. He didn't live up to his own standards. So this is a really deep concern because we have these, these already established standards that were set up by mainly liberals and progressives and globalists themselves. And, and their own fraud uh, fails those standards. I, I do want to come to questions from our audience if we have any uh, Adam, but uh, just to, to sort of wrap that up, uh, we haven't talked about mail-in ballots and the contribution that they have made to widespread fraud in certainly the states that are being contested at the moment, and I think others as well. Um, Phil, uh, speaking of uh, Jimmy Carter, as Mike has done, uh, he and James Baker very pointedly said some years back, mail-in ballots are rife with the danger of fraud. Um, and yet, again, the question occurs, how could all of this be? How could it be that we have a worse election system than banana republics, a less secure one, that, that doesn't meet basic standards, uh, international or you know the Carter Center or what have you? Talk a little bit about the situation we're in Yes, but how we got into it, as best you can tell, from what you've been studying and, and testifying to around the country. So uh, to, let me go back just a little bit to uh, the, the, the statement that Chris Krebs put up on the uh, DHS uh, CISA, uh, Cybersecurity and Information um, Security Agency, Infrastructure Security Agency. He hung his hat on two, two points. Number one, that these, these systems were not connected to the Internet. So they couldn't be interdicted. And number two, that the states had mechanisms in place to prevent fraudulent voting. So if you begin your argument with two lies, then the rest of your argument 
cannot be anything but a lie. These systems are connected to the internet. We've had um, firsthand testimony in, in Georgia and, and other states in, in Michigan and Arizona that, you know, number one, uh, a lady, a precinct uh, head in Georgia, she pulled up her poll pads and they were programmed for another, um, another polling precinct. So were her tabulators. She called the help desk in Colorado and they fixed them remotely, just like a help desk you would with Microsoft or Apple. They're connected. They're connected to the internet. They report up all the way to the Amazon web cloud, to Clarity Elections, to Edison Research that provides live updates to the news media. So I don't, I don't see how, and you see those updates, the numbers are ticking up. How do they get there? They don't drive, they don't drive a tape from, uh, you know, Detroit, Michigan to New York to, uh, to get it added up to the television station. It just doesn't happen that way. And then number two, if the states have the responsibility to, to manage their own roles, in Pennsylvania and Michigan, tens of thousands of people who had voter IDs who voted in Michigan and Pennsylvania also had obituaries, tens of thousands. So if, you know, if you're saying that the states have, um, you know, uh, mechanisms in place to prevent dead voters from voting, how do we have 17,327 voters that voted in the general election in Michigan also had current obituaries. So the fallacy of his, of his statement, it, it, you know, it, it starts off, you know, built on, built on a lie. And also uh, Dominion Voting Systems was on his selection, his election security advisory council uh, from CISA. So I don't know, in, 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 the, in the country, we call that letting the fox in the hen house. Yeah. Um, I that actually the uh, statement that was put out by that uh, advisory council um, was actually drafted by the Dominion representatives. So uh, it, it's simply crazy making that we find ourselves not simply trying to figure out how much fraud took place, but having to explain that we must ourselves bear some responsibility for letting this happen because of these systems or lack of systems that have been put in place supposedly to uh, help facilitate the election process. Adam, uh, do we have any questions from our audience that we might take up at this point? We have tons of questions. So I'm, I'm going to try to combine some themes that are coming up here. So, um, well, several asking about um, how much convincing evidence is there for the reported raid on the Dominion facility in Europe? Is there any specificity available on what they were seeking and what they found? Or who they were, not least. Okay. Who do you want to take, take that one? The, uh, the only evidence that we had was um, IP tracking to the, uh, to the server in Germany. There, there, was, there was a street address. Um, that was reported. Um, to the White House, I believe, on the 8th, and then nine hours later, the server went offline. That's the only factual information that I have. So the whole story that it, it was a raid and that it secured the servers and all of that, as best you know, is not uh, is not accurate. Mike, do you have anything you can share on that subject? I don't have any information on that, no. If you, uh, if you eliminate the possibilities, um, it would not, could not have been a Title X military operation. Um, more than likely, it would not have been a cooperative operation if it was a foreign company in a non-military, because uh, um, Merkel would probably have not have cooperated. Um, if it was in, in a U.S. property, uh, and, and the only other potential uh, explanation was it, a, it was a Title 50 operation. And if it was a Title 50 operation, more than likely, we'll never know. That would be intelligence services. But Correct. The covert action. If, if presumably it, they secured it for the purposes of uh, making available such information, uh, we would know about it. And if they didn't, uh, that's a, another indictment, isn't it? Uh, Adam, back to you. People are uh, talking about alternatives. So uh, if you get feedback on two, which is uh, blockchain technology, or going back to uh, universal, universal paper ballots. Personally, I'm a big fan of the latter because I don't understand the former. But uh, Phil, I know you do. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, when I first be, I became aware of this issue, um, I 
went to a good friend of mine who has been in the banking industry all your life. So if you want to talk to somebody who knows how to secure something, you talk to a banker because uh, when there's money involved, they get serious. Um, it, it, it can be as easy as your Venmo account that's on your phone. It's a positive ID and there's a, there's a balance and a transactional um, rigidity that, that is inspectable and repeatable. Um, the, uh, I've come to learn after I started doing the research, um, there, there's a group, uh, professors from MIT who developed a system called, um, votes, V O A T Z, which is uh, blockchain and it's in use in several States, uh, in, in this election cycle. Uh, one of those professors who came down from MIT to the Texas A&M cybersecurity center where, uh, we, I do a little bit of work, um, also has, um, uh, executable uh, systems ready ready to, to be stood up. And so I think based on uh, what, what people are aware of now that these types of systems will be much more, um, you know, much more palatable now that, uh, that they understand and they're willing to do a little bit of research to understand what a blockchain or a um, positive ID system, you know, when, especially when you compare it to your, your Venmo account or your Apple Pay account, they understand that. And um, with a real ID, um, it's much, much less, um, much less potential to uh, to be manipulated in bulk like we see uh, going on with these systems. Yeah. Uh, if I may, just add a quick question to Mike. Uh, obviously, from what you've described and, and Phil has, uh, Georgia is the next challenge. Uh, and if we don't change the way we're doing business there, or did in this last election cycle, or is it reasonable to expect that we're going to get a similar fraudulent outcome, uh, making the point that we do need some sort of difference, whether it's blockchain or whether it's uh, some of the kinds of steps that Phil was talking about earlier? Your thoughts? I know, why, if, if there's an allegation of a fundamental corruption of the system, why would you use that same system to recount it and to audit itself. It makes no sense unless you want to perpetuate fraud. Right, right. Uh, the Einstein theory applies, right? Uh, it's insanity. Uh, Adam, back to you. North Carolina was one of the states that had a pause on election day. Nevertheless, Trump did prevail. In spite of that, the election for governor had some strange results. Please comment on what we know about the legitimacy of the North Carolina 2020 election. Phil, I'm going to ask you that if you have any thoughts on it, but but also if you would just more generally talk about the the role that the the suspension of the counting of ballots in I think all of these uh, contested states uh, played in the fraud that seems to have been perpetrated. So looking historically at, at what happened, and, and we looked at, we mentioned uh, Matt Bevin's race, and then in Texas, the uh, you know the psyop of the blue wave, and that uh, Beto would uh, would defeat Ted Cruz in in the in the Texas Senate election, hands down. There was the wave coming. So we think they they uh, looking at some of the the anomalous results there. Use this as part of one of their their you know, their test ops or exercises. Um, they, and I think North Carolina might draw some, some parallels, the rural vote where these, uh, you know, these techniques of manipulating the votes couldn't be done in mass numbers. Uh, in, in Texas, for example, the, the East Texas and the West Texas, a rural vote came out in such numbers that it overwhelmed the urban, you know, mostly blue, uh, places where they were, they were trying to manipulate the votes, electronically to, to come up with a balance. Um, the, the rural vote really overwhelmed their ability to, to shift enough votes. Uh, it almost did in Arizona. Maricopa is the fourth largest county in the country and it's down to a 9,000 vote differential. Same thing I happened, I believe happened in North Carolina. Um, and again, I, I've said previously, I, if, if you want um, you know Beto to be your Senator and you vote and, and one vote counts for one person and Beto wins fair and square, then that's great. But, uh, you know, it's, it's an American issue. And if it's a strongly democratic urban area, well, yeah, you'd expect, um, you know, a, a democratic candidate to, who relates to the, to the folks that live there to, to win. But, uh, North Carolina, I believe was that one of those instances where the overwhelming turnout in mass just overwhelmed the ability of, of the, uh, those manipulated votes, 
um, to to count um, the mail in ballots. The, the mail in ballots they were they were just overwhelmed. I think four four times four to four or more times as many mail in ballots uh, were submitted in this election than the previous election. And again, it just adds uh, the potential where the early elections before they would calculate how many they needed to get on election day. But with the shift and delayed counting for mail-in votes, they actually had to stop, do the calculations where they were, how much we still needed to win. And then that was the opportunity to go like in Pennsylvania and Arizona to those stashes of ballots to inject those ballots into uh, in, into the, the count so that, you know, the theory is that once they're separated from the envelope, they're just a ballot and nobody can disclaim that ballot. Unfortunately, we have the technology now to analyze the physical ballots and tell if they were machine printed, hand printed, uh, if they were hand marked or, or machine marked. And if there was a difference in the paper, if the paper ballot was folded, if it wasn't folded. So um, again, we just need to open the trunk and examine the body. Those are the forensics that are being brought to bear. And, and I think it's fair to say, as you've indicated, Phil, that all of those did happen in some of these places. So we do need to uh, examine the body, as you say. Uh, Adam? Several questions along the lines of why haven't certain agencies investigated or prosecuted? And are there any left that, you know, feasibly could still do so? Mike, I think that may be to you. You were talking about the FBI's uh, uh, neural systems being compromised. Uh, what What are your thoughts about uh, who's who's available to do this job properly? It doesn't seem like anyone's available anymore. Uh, although our checks and balances are such that it allows citizens to come in and get involved, like like Colonel Phil is doing, and and Sidney Powell and others are doing. So we do have that check and balance left. But from the actual prosecutorial level. Keep in mind that for the past several years, uh, George Soros has been funding the the elections of, of DAs and and others at the secretaries of state at the state and local levels around the country, and other people haven't paid attention. So this is a big payoff for those who have invested uh, over the long term in getting individuals into office who will look the other way at the proper times. Another problem is we don't really have a counterintelligence service anymore the way we used to, especially when it comes to looking at the political warfare that other countries are conducting against us to subvert and manipulate our political system. And if a foreign power can subvert our attitudes and perceptions as a public and influence our elections either through persuasion or through manipulation, that's the real prize because they could defeat us without winning without fighting rather, they can defeat us without using weapons. And if you look at the regimes whose interest it is to manipulate the elections the way it has been, you look at everything from Venezuela to Cuba, which, which the Obama Biden team gave full recognition to with no conditions, uh, to communist China, to Putin's Russia, to Iran, all of these regimes have a, have a, have a their, their very survival is rooted in who is president of the United States and what the, that president's policies will be. So they all have the motive and many have the capability to manipulate our system. Yeah. And there's evidence that they have as well. Um, Mike, speaking of individual citizens uh, being involved, uh, I did want to ask you about Mark Zuckerberg as well and this arrangement that he engaged in that apparently also contributed to what certain officials in state election agencies uh, were willing to see or not see or do or not do. Can you shed light on that? Sure. Well, you see Zuckerberg, uh, the CEO of Facebook, has been, he put, what, $350 million of his and his wife's money into, uh, into shaping how these votes were, how the whole voting process was shaped, and then the vote uh, conducting and counting process was done. It's and it's perfectly legal to do. So he has this money, and you can see he's been very responsive to what the Chinese government wants and doesn't want. It's part of his business model. So if you have a guy like that putting that amount of money in to a voter system while using his platform to censor opposing points of view and to to raise questions about and to ban factual evidence that goes against what his his and the Chinese 
mutually uh, supportive line is you've got a real problem with now private interests with foreign ties legally subverting our electoral system. Right. Follow the money. Um, sorry, did you have something else, Phil? Follow, always follow the money and, and ask yourself uh, who stands to gain. Look at the connections. Um, again, pattern analysis. It doesn't matter if they're um, EFP uh, networks, exclusively formed project projectile networks uh, coming out of Iran to Shia folks killing U.S. soldiers in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, or if it's, you know, Pakistani ISI um, influenced um, bombings and assassinations inside Afghanistan. Where, who stands to gain? The U.S. government as a financial interest is is the biggest in the world. If you control that power and that business, that's corruptible in in no uncertain terms. It's it's follow the money. Indeed, um, Adam. Last question. Yeah, it's a big one, but I just have you know lots of people are asking just basically what's your prognosis? What what do you think? How do you think this is going to end up? And of course. Going forward, how can we prevent this in the future? Mike, shall we start with you and take it to the last? Well, I think the prognosis is poor because we we don't have a national security community that detects these threats and recognizes them and acts when it should without all sorts of public exposure poured on it. So I think uh, we, we simply don't have it in our Washington uh, DNA anymore to fight these things. There's no... Um, no counter political warfare capability. There's a terrible counterintelligence capability where so many of the arrests we're seeing are just low hanging fruit uh, from short term operations designed to just grab people and have them arrested, whether it's a Chinese spy at a university lab or whatever. So we don't have that strategic outlook that we used to have long ago. And, and the intelligence community and the security apparatus overall has become so politicized. I think our country's in great danger. Is that the whole fundamental point of this webinar today is looking at the this as a constitutional issue, not as a gee, we wish Trump got reelected and it's too bad Joe Biden got reelected or whatever we're saying. It's not a policy or a political one. Once we lose our right to have each citizen's ballot count, we lose the whole concept of government through the consent of the governed, and our constitution is gone. Representative government at its core. Phil, uh, last word, if you would. I'll take the opposing position. I think our prognosis is extremely bright because the American people are realizing what's been done to them by our government, by those elected officials. And I don't think the American people are going to stand for this. Um, if you look in history, 3% uh, of the population stood up to the largest power in the world at that time and uh, made our voices be known. So whatever that looks like, I think uh, the American people realize and they realize that the power of the government um, is the power of the American people. And I don't think they're going to stand for it. We have very, I think, helpfully framed uh, both the information that we need to make informed decisions about election fraud in this particular election uh, and the potential for it in the imminent one in Georgia, as well as, as Mike Waller has said, uh, the future of our republic, which requires confidence in free and fair elections if we are to remain um, a constitutional republic uh, and a representative uh, one at that form of government. Um, I wanna thank both Mike Waller, Dr. Mike Waller, and Colonel Phil Waldron for so immensely contributing to both our understanding of what's going on at the moment and to the work that you are both doing to try to ensure that this does come out right. And I pray to God that you will be successful and that all of us, every single one of us who does have a stake in the outcome of this election and all that flows from it, will do our part to help ensure that our constitutional republic will survive and indeed, as Phil Waldron has just said, be much the better for this hard experience. With that, Adam Savitt, I'll turn it back over to you and just say again, my thanks to our audience, uh, both present and future, and uh, thanks to you for making all this possible and all the rest of the great work of the Center for Security Policy. 
Thanks, everyone. Actually, I don't have an exact date of our next uh, webinar, but we, they will be coming up. You'll, if you know about this one, you'll get an email, and uh, we'll let you know. Thanks for joining us today. Go on. Thanks very, very much. much. Thank you. Bye-bye.